Absolutely. Uh, well, I will then call this meeting to order, and I would ask that we observe a moment of silence for uh, for our, our NCOIL friend, Representative Smith. And the fun thing about moments of silence is it's entirely up to the person who's called the moment of silence. And I felt that that was a moment. Um, I'm gonna move forward with this. Uh, Will, roll call. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, start with committee members who have registered. Uh, Georgia Senator Larry Walker. Uh, Indiana Representative Matt Lehman. Here. Kentucky Representative Mike Meredith. Here. Kentucky Representative Rachel Roberts. Louisiana Representative Edmund Jordan. Here. Massachusetts Representative David LaBeouf. Here. Michigan Representative Brenda Carter. Here. New York Assemblyman Jared Gandolfo. New York <laughs> Assemblywoman Pam Hunter. Ohio Senator Bob Hackett. Here. Ohio Senator George Lang. Here. Texas Representative Tom Oliverson. Here. Utah Representative Jim Dunnigan. West Virginia Delegate Steve Westfall. Here. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Kentucky Representative uh, Sarge Pollack. Here. And we have uh, Chairman Bennett. And now we'll move on to other legislators that have registered. Uh, Arkansas Representative Deborah Ferguson. Great. Connecticut Representative. I think we are. Representative Ferguson, is that you? I think that was someone else. Uh, Kentucky Representative Jill Barry. Maryland Senator Antonio Hayes. Missouri Representative Bob Titus. New Jersey Assemblyman Roy Freeman. New York Assemblyman Jake Blumenkrantz. Here. New York Senator Pam Helming. Oklahoma Representative Ellen Hefner. Here. West Virginia Delegate Walter Hall. West Virginia Senator Eric Nelson. Okay, are there any le other legislators present I did not call? I'm here also. Representative Nellie Nickel out of Montana. Okay, Representative Nickel, anyone else? All right, Mr. Chairman, uh, we'll just need a motion to waive the quorum requirement. I'd see, I'd, uh, can I make that motion or is that, do I call I, on I'll, the committee? I'll move we waive the quorum. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 All opposed? All right, thank you so much. And welcome everyone to my first committee meeting as chairman of uh, the Property and Casualty Committee. I'm obviously off to a sterling start, uh, unable to figure out how to make my video work, um, but I promise you'll see more than you really want to of me when we get to Nashville. Um, I wanna begin by saying I'm honored to be uh, appointed to chair this committee uh, for this year. And I look forward to building on the great work that Representative Jordan did though. Uh, I'm not sure that I can step up to his fashion standards, but I'll do my best. Um, this committee uh, promises to get to again this year be uh, pretty busy, uh, and I'm ready to hit the ground running. Starting with this meeting, um, we have two model laws on the agenda today, one of which it looks like we'll be voting on. And then for the other model, uh, we'll be discussing which direction we want to take collectively moving forward. So we'll start with the continued discussion and consideration of the INCOIL Public Adjuster Professional Standards Reform Model Act. Uh, I know that a lot of work has gone into developing this model and the latest version was distributed and posted on the website earlier this week. 
Um, and I will turn things over to the sponsor of this model, Kentucky Representative Michael Meredith. Uh, and after we hear from, from him, I want to open things up to any interested parties uh, from industry uh, and others that want to speak. And then after that, we'll talk to any legislators that have questions or comments. Uh, and when everyone's finished, we will have a vote on this model. But Representative Meredith, I yield to you. Thank you, Chairman Bennett. I want to thank my uh, co-sponsors of this legislation, Representative Lehman and Dale Westfall as well, for being on the call today. And I want to thank all the other legislators and guests for their time. Uh, and I want to thank NCOL for taking up this issue. Uh, this public adjuster model is based largely on what we adopted in, in Kentucky last year. Um, and um, we started with a focus that was consumer protection, transparency, uh, and preventing conflicts of interest in this space. Uh, I'm not in any way trying to prohibit public adjusters from conduct conducting their work or being in business. We just want to ensure that consumers are protected in the best manner possible. Uh, as you can see by looking at the latest version of the model, we've moved around on a lot of different things, and there's been a lot of work done because of the input of insurers, committee members, and the, the public adjuster industry. I know a lot of comments have been and continue to be related to the fee cap portions, uh, and in Section 7 of the model, we now have a fee cap of 15% for catastrophic for non-catastrophic claims and 10% for catastrophic claims. That was not where we started, but that is where we ended in Kentucky with our bill as well. Uh, when we went through the full legislative process last year, uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to lower caps. Some states do have lower caps and that's why you have the drafting notes that you have in there about the cap language. But I do think that caps matter in a bill like this, and we need to make sure, again, that insureds are not losing too much of their insurance proceeds in the process and having to come up with that much more out of pocket or having to borrow the money to make the repairs they need to make. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have uh, and be happy to open up the discussion at this time. But I do wanna again, thank everybody for the work. Uh, and I think this is a great sign to show to NCOIL as we continue to have other states looking at this issue. Uh, I know there are two that have already introduced this year uh, and, and probably some others that are under consideration right now. Uh, so getting this model out there for NCOIL, I think showcases our work uh, as an organization uh, as, as these states continue to move forward on the issue. I'll stop there. Like I said, happy to answer any questions, but back over to you, Chairman Bennett. Thank you so much, Representative. Um, and before we open it up again to uh, other legislators, um, do we have any comments by by anyone else? I can add in. Um, I think a lot of you guys have received our positions. I, my name is Cole Klein. I'm president of the American Association of Public Insurance Adjusters. Um, we're a national association of public adjusters and uh, our, put consumers first um, in, in everything we do. Um, we, we feel strongly that uh, the fee cap provisions uh, take away choice from policyholders and it severely restricts policyholders with average size losses uh, from being able to retain professional licensed assistance on their claims. Um, these are, uh, again, policyholders with average size claims of uh, $25,000 and less. So um, we would like to see those, uh, uh, the fee caps be uh, raised to provide choice for, for policyholders. So. Mr. Chairman, if you're calling on other folks, I'd like to speak briefly. Sure, John, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, John Schnauz, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, uh, Property and Casualty Insurance Trade Association. I'd like to thank Representative Meredith, along with Representatives Lehman and Delegate Westfall for their work on this. Um, is this model perfect? No, none ever is, but we do think a lot of improvement has been made and we are here today in support of the model. Ask the committee to please vote in support of it. Um, particularly because uh, at this point in the year, a lot of states are still in session and the blessing of NCOIL now would allow this model to be deployed in other states around the country. Since it was raised, I will speak very briefly to the fee cap provision. Um, we do think it's an important part of the model. 
I would note that many states, including my home state of Texas, uh, have fee caps. Texas has had a 10% across the board fee cap for 20 years. I went back and looked at the legislative history on that. There has been no bill filed to raise that cap since at least 2011. Um, I think that speaks to the fact that it doesn't restrict the ability of people to hire public adjusters. We have 1,500 or so licensed public adjusters in the state the last time I checked. So the other point I would make is the percentage is a percentage of the entire claim settlement. It is not a percentage of what the public adjuster is getting the policyholder on top of what the insurer is already not contesting. So we think that's important context. Again, I'll be brief, happy to answer any questions, but we are here today in support of the model, ask the committee's favorable consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John. Anyone else from uh, that, that's not a legislator have any comments to add? Feels like that means no. Uh, I will then open this up to legislators. And of course, if there's anyone from industry who decides that there is something that they do want to say, please uh, don't hesitate to, to hop in after a legislator speaks, but please, any legislators um, who have comments or questions uh, for Representative Meredith, please let me know. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Delegate Westfall. I have a few comments. Go ahead, Steve. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Yeah, um, I'm very happy we are passing this um, model act today. This bill is in already passed out of the Banking Insurance Committee. Uh, we made some minor modifications to it. That some of this stuff was already in West Virginia code. Um, so I think it's a good thing. I think it's a, a consumer protection type thing uh, act. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I think you said, uh, Texas had 10% and never had been changed for 20 years plus. Uh, we're looking at 10% also across the board. Uh, we currently in West Virginia have 10% for cat losses, but unlimited for other losses. And I think that's where the problem is. It's, it's happening in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, of West Virginia right now, uh, coming across from Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, it's not happening other places, but I think it will. So I'm a big supporter of the bill. We're planning on running it out of West Virginia next week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I can make a few comments. You certainly may. Um, yeah, so I support. Obviously, I'm I'm on this. And I'm supportive of this. I I think if I look at what uh, we're trying to do here, so in Indiana we passed uh, uh, and and Cole was in MOF several times in the last session and back in 23 we passed out this. What we did is not have we do not have a fee cap uh, in Indiana. Um, I think what we really wanted to do is to to you talked about transparency. We wanted to make sure we had some very uh, bright lines between what the adjuster's role was as a public adjuster and what their role, what, what an insured role was, and there, those lines were getting blurred. Uh, we saw um, we saw insureds losing their right to be able to file a complaint, losing their right to a claim. Um, and again, there's bad players in every industry, but we just wanted to make sure that we were doing something that brought some clarity to what their role is. And and, and I think as, as Representative Meredith may have said at the beginning, we didn't want to necessarily uh, uh, you know, eliminate the industry, but we did need to put some really strong parameters around them. Um, I do think it's it, it merits a discussion on fee schedules. Does it have them? What it's going to be? But I guess I'll I'll kind of end with what has been our philosophy, or has been always been my philosophy at Encoil is you know we're all we're all going to be different back in our states. You know, we we build Encoil. His role is definitely to build that strong foundation. You know, put a piece of legislation out there that I can take back to my state. And, you know, the frame is there, the foundation is there, and I'll put the windows in and I'll, you know, I'll choose a different type of, uh, uh, you know, hangings in the house. But but each state needs to know this is what has been vetted um, through a process with multiple states hands on deck. And therefore, I think this has gone through that process, very supportive of the model where it's at today, and I'm looking forward to adopting it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Lehman. I appreciate your your input. And um, you know, I, two years ago, I uh, my parents, <clears throat> my childhood home caught fire, and and my parents were beside themselves, and I, I wasn't um, I wasn't 
well versed enough about public adjusters. They ended up using one. I was skeptical at first, uh, but at least in my parents' case, it was a great help. Uh, that said, I, I understand and, and hear concerns around caps, uh, and that's the beautiful thing about model legislation is that we are we are setting a precedent and states can take it back. And I, I think in Oklahoma, in fact, we're going to be running this legislation, some version of it this year. So um, I appreciate uh, that I've come in as chairman on the back end of this conversation, but that a lot of work has been done. And obviously everybody's been at the table. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, any other legislators wishing to make any comments or ask any questions? All right. Well, if there is no further discussion, after a lot of discussion about this, uh, I will entertain a motion to adopt the model. Mr. Motion Chair, on the I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 All opposed? It sounds to my ears as if that passed. The model will uh, be placed on the executive committee's agenda now and will be uh, discussed uh, on their agenda in Nashville for final ratification. Next on our agenda is a continued discussion on the INQOIL Catalytic Converter Theft Prevention Model Act. And I'm sure I speak for all legislators when I say we haven't talked nearly enough about the catalytic converter issue. Um, I know way more about catalytic converters than I ever thought I would. We've been discussing this issue since the spring meeting last year, and during the committee's last meeting in November, there was a discussion around whether this model is somewhat outside the scope of the committee's normal work. It was stated that while it certainly can be argued that there's no downstream insurance, there is a downstream insurance consequence to stolen catalytic converters. You can sort of say that about anything that's stolen. Um, also, this issue really gets into the territory of a state's criminal code. Uh, and I think that the model would likely end up being presented in uh, com committees that are not states insurance committees. In, in our state, catalytic converter issues have gone through um, uh, general government or uh, other things, not, not insurance. Anyway, to that end, some have called for the model to be withdrawn and instead to see the committee adopt a resolution encouraging states to enact stricter laws governing catalytic converter thefts. Um, I do note that since the committee's last meeting, an amended version of the model has been submitted by the National Insurance of Crime Bureau, NICB, in consultation with other interested stakeholders, um, and it aims to make the model more insurance-centric. So I encourage you to find that um, updated model on the website if you haven't already. That model has been distributed. Um, it's posted on the website, pretty easy to find, and the amendments are in the form of two added sections. One of those sections would require that the designated department begin a study on the economic impact of catalytic converter thefts on the insurance industry. Um, I think a report and recommendations for legislative action would then be submitted to the governor and legislative leadership um, with that. And then the other section would require the department to establish catalytic converter theft task force for the prevention, reduction, and investigation of catalytic converter theft. That ta task force would have authority Subject, of course, to the authorization appropriation to establish a grant program for the provision of funds to state and local agencies to provide grants to do a number of things aimed at preventing and reducing catalytic converter theft. So um, that's what's been presented to this committee so far. And today I'd love to hear again from both legislators and interested parties as to what direction they'd like to see us take um, to either continue development of the model law with the new provisions or to develop a resolution. After we hear from the sponsors of the model, I will open things up to any interested parties, and then I'll open things up to legislators for questions and comments. Um, and with that, I believe Representative Oliverson is in line to make some comments. Representative? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And, uh, you know, look, um, I, I understand the sentiments that perhaps it wouldn't a model act wouldn't necessarily go through um, an insurance committee. Uh, I get it. But the reality is, is that this is a significant cost driver and an escalating cost driver uh, for a lot of the, uh, our property and casualty policies within this space. Um, it is not a victimless crime. Uh, and I think it is it is one of those crimes that uh, we I think we do a, a great service to the industry as an organization 
by just reminding everybody and taking a position on this and just saying that this needs more attention. Uh, it just doesn't take that long to steal somebody's catalytic converter. Um, it en ends up uh, costing a fair amount to replace. Uh, it ends up taking a fair amount of time to replace. Uh, it's taking people's cars off the road. Um, we, we are aware, at least in Texas, our legislation that concerns catalytic converter theft was named after a Harris County deputy that was shot to death uh, while confronting uh, these thieves who uh, undoubtedly are organized crime participants. And so, you know, it's a significant cost to the industry. And I think anytime we have a situation where there's an obvious stressor to uh, the property and casualty marketplace that we can point to and recognize whether it's crime related or not crime related really shouldn't be a factor in whether or not we take a position on it, because quite frankly, uh, we're in the business of ensuring stability in the state based system of insurance and making sure that our constituents have access to affordable property and casualty automobile policies. And if this is a significant factor in disrupting that, then I think we owe it to uh, the people of our states to take a position on it. So. Um, I'm strongly in favor of the model. I will continue to be pushing strongly for a model uh, in any in all capacities that I can, um, and I look forward to seeing it adopted. Thank you, uh, Representative Oliverson, for those comments. Um, believe now. I missed my spot. I want to make sure that I'm giving everybody who's supposed to speak an opportunity to do so. Um, Ro, yeah, of course, Representative Jordan, my uh, my predecessor. Uh, would you like to add any comments? Just a few things. Thank you. I agree with most of what uh, Representative Oliverson has said. Uh, I think, you know, the model itself certainly would have a purpose and I think it's well-intentioned, but for me, I don't think it really falls under the purview of any of the state insurance committees. So um, while I obviously support the overall issue, as I'm sponsoring the model, uh, I, I certainly would think that the resolution is the best path forward here. I think that's everybody, um, I think everybody can win in that scenario. And uh, I think an end call is still taking a position and offering guidance. But as an organization, we aren't getting into the position of producing models that are outside the scope of our committees. So I think with that, I think the resolution is the is the best path forward. And I'd send it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Jordan. I appreciate that input. Do I have any comments or questions from um, interested parties? Yes, Eric DeCampos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, my name is Eric DeCampos and I represent the National Insurance Crime Bureau. Uh, as previously mentioned, NICB recently submitted additional language uh, for this model. And this language is an initial attempt to address some of the committee's concerns raised during the fall meeting in Columbus. Uh, but despite the introduction of this new language, which uh, certainly will require some more work to get us where we need to be, I do wish to reiterate a point I made during the fall meeting in which this model act will set a precedent to address a key concern for the insurance industry and is within the scope of this committee's consideration. It can be argued that this model falls under the same category as other non-traditional insurance models that have been adopted by this committee, such as the model act regarding auto airbag fraud and the consumer protection model towing act which were both recently readopted in 2023. And these bills are often considered in Judiciary and Transportation Committees, so they're not guaranteed to always fall under an insurance committee. Given the historical precedent set by this committee through the adoption, through the adoption of the aforementioned models, we respectfully request that the committee continue its consideration of the model for potential adoption with further discussion to be held during the spring meeting in Nashville. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. I see Brad Nail is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I will say thank you to the to the sponsors and the others who've uh, worked diligently on this issue. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of Enterprise Mobility, which is Enterprise Rent-A-Car, National Car Rental, Alamo Rent-A-Car, and their other numerous lines of business. 
Uh, all told, Enterprise and its subsidiaries have a fleet of over 2.3 million vehicles, making it the largest fleet owner in the world. So we feel the effects of catalytic converter theft on a large scale. I thought it might help the committee to hear some real data on the impact of this crime from the perspective of an insured, or in our case, a self-insured victim. Uh, from January 2023 to January 2024, we had approximately 3,000 catalytic converter losses for a total of over $8.5 million in losses. And if anything, those numbers are low because not all catalytic converter thefts get categorized in a way that makes them easily identifiable in claim systems. So that is a low end estimate for us. So as one company with over $8.5 million in unrecoverable losses to our bottom line, we would like to see the law reflect the scope and impact of the criminal operations engaged in these thefts. Now, the data from NICB shows that thefts are still on the rise. Uh, of the top states for most thefts, almost all lack a statute establishing catalytic converter theft as a crime, meaning they're relying on their general theft or larceny statutes. And we have seen theft, uh, we have seen statutes in some states that specifically address catalytic converter theft result in fewer incidents. So I think there's value in putting the statutory spotlight on this issue. North Carolina is a good example of a state that established felony penalties for catalytic converter theft in 2021 and saw an immediate decrease after its enactment. As to the appropriate role for NCOIL on this issue, there is precedent for models promulgated by the PNC committee to address criminal liability for certain actions. The Distracted Driving Model Act included misdemeanor criminal penalties, the anti-runners fraud bill included fe uh, felony criminal penalties for violations. Insurance and anti-fraud efforts and special investigation units frequently deal with criminal activity, and we think this issue is analogous to other legislative anti-fraud efforts. So given our experience, we urge the committee to pursue model legislation that we think will have an impact in deterring this crime. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate those comments. Next, looks like we've got Todd Foreman. Uh, good good afternoon. Uh, Todd Foreman with ISRI. I'm the Director of Law Enforcement uh, of Law Enforcement Outreach for ISRI. Um, I wanted to comment a little bit on, on this because there are, uh, all the states except for Wyoming have laws um, related to catalytic converters. They all are different in various ways, and that's as we mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, Texas has some very good laws. Uh, North Carolina has some very good laws with felonies for possession of the catalytic converter. Virginia also has that. Uh, what we would ask is maybe to make this a point of where it would be included, the model would be included in the current laws and added to the laws instead of creating a new law um, because it can make it more confusing for law enforcement and for the uh, industry because it can uh, conflict. So we would ask that you, you continue with this, but there are, some there are some edits that we would ask to be made for because there are certain people on here that you have that um, probably shouldn't be buying uh, detached catalytic murders that are listed on your list of, um, on there. And I will, I will send that to you later. Um, but there's some edits to it that I would ask and what ask you add to it that it could be um, incorporated in the current laws if they already exist uh, as related to catalytic converters. Thank you so much, Todd, for that. Uh, is there anyone, I don't see anyone else with a hand up. Thank you so much to those of you who did that. That's very helpful. Um, is there anyone else that is not a legislator that wants to comment on this? Jorge? You know what? That could be George, and I apologize for that if I was wrong. Nope, it's it's Jorge. Thank you so much. Uh, then I shouldn't have said the second part at all. But no, you're... Uh, name's Jorge Conforme. I'm with LKQ Corporation. LKQ, um, uh, we're here with uh, wearing our automotive recycler hat. As part of the salvage process, LKQ acquires... Uh, vehicles from insurance companies, um, insurance options throughout the salvage process. These vehicles come with attached catalytic converters. In reviewing the language, um, we wanted to raise the question of whether or not um, 
a scrapped motor vehicle will include a vehicle that is acquired for purchases of dismantling or recycling. Um, that is a question that I wanted to raise. And also under covered activity, um, you know, companies like LKQ do not purchase detached catalytic converters. The only catalytic converters that we acquire and pull from vehicles are catalytic converters that come with the vehicle. And then when we do detach those catalytic converters, we don't sell them back out to the public. What we do is we send them to a refan, uh, remanufacture um, facility that we have, I believe, in Virginia. So um, I just wanted to um, ensure that um, legal, proper um, industries like the automotive dismantling and recycling industry are covered under covered activities and that scrap motor vehicle does include motor vehicles acquired for the purposes of recycling and dismantling. Um, Mr. Chair, I thank you for the opportunity to um, just provide this comment and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor, I appreciate those comments uh, and the hand raised gesture. Anyone else uh, from industry or interested parties want to weigh in? All right, how about the less opinionated state legislators? Any legislators on the call wishing to make comments or ask any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Delegate Westfall. I have two comments. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, I took what we had from Columbus and tried to incorporate in what current laws we have in West Virginia. We do have some penalties and some laws in West Virginia about re you know, reselling catalytic converters and uh, just see what we could come up with. We got what I think a pretty good piece of legislation. It got a few people, people's attention, which what I tried to do. Um, it did not get sent to my banking insurance committee. It got sent to the Judiciary Committee, single reference. And we've discussed it, and then we parked it really for this year, hoping that we can come up with some type of model of legislation within COIL. Now, this is the problem across all, all every state. I don't think it's isolated to some region of, of the United States. And with, I think a couple people said, with the model of legislation, I think we have a better chance of passing good legislation and incorporate it. I think Mr. Foreman said they're trying to incorporate what we have already in code, not making a, a new part of the code, but doing what we have now, which I tried to do. Um, so I think we need to go forward because, it, like I say, probably not going to go to banking insurance, but it's a problem with insurance companies. Um, we have we have stolen monthly here in West Virginia from my agency and stuff. So I just thought I'd tell you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug Westall. I appreciate those comments. Um, we've we've had our own adventures with with uh, catalytic converter legislation in our state, and you're you're spot on. It usually doesn't go through the insurance committee here either. Um, any other? Oh, uh, Representative LaBeouf. Great, thank you, Please. Mr. Chairman. So you know, looking at the model, and again, I wasn't at the um, Columbus meeting, so I may be missing some context. Um, it's a great model. The real sticking point that I see are section five and six, um, because it's so prescriptive on the um, the offenses, you know, especially like for so section five automatically categorizing as a felony, at least in Massachusetts, a um, hit and run, a first time DUI and assault and battery or misdemeanors. So I wonder if there's a way to find a happy medium where you focus on kind of the processes in the other elements of the bill, and then maybe have some type of attachment or statement explaining the logic of either a need for some type of progressive offense or what the impact has been on. Because I could see immediately, if you have something like that, you could have particular um, you know, criminal justice advocates against it if it's an automatic felony. Um, and then it also gets into, you know, the 17 year old that's at the bottom of the chain, should they be treated the same as someone who's kind of leading the ring? Um, so that's that's my take on on my read of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Anyone else with comments on on this? Would we'll be interested to hear from other uh, legislators, whether you're um, more interested in seeing this go a resolution way or um, 
model legislation way. Either way, I believe that um, I'll be following up with the authors of this and, and Inquil staff following this meeting to discuss what we'll what we'll plan to do, and we'll be revisiting it um, at the spring meeting. But uh, any other any other comments on this? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I, just a, a a brief comment. I you know, I've been around Inquil a long time. We we've danced on this line before. That line between, you know, is it really more of a criminal action or is it really a, 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 an insurance action? Um, and I think that I, mean, I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of doing this. I think it's on the agenda for April. I think we debate it then. I think we have a, a very robust discussion. Um, I'd be curious to know just where, you know, if I, if I, if this model were in Indiana, the majority of it, 99% of it would fall under a criminal code, and that's where they'd go to the criminal code bill. It would go that route into that committee. But I do think there are parts of this that do touch that insurance rail. And so I think if, you know, we may have a situation where this bill would end up in the insurance committee or even reassigned or, you know, after the past the court's criminal code. So I think the fact that there is an insurance piece, this a very important insurance piece. I think we need to continue this conversation and then uh, uh, decisions can be made moving forward as to what the end end is. But I, um, I do, I do think this is a hugely important issue and a growing problem that we need to continue to address. I agree with that, Representative Lehman, and uh, sounds like we'll probably be having a pretty robust conversation again this spring on this issue. Representative Bennett, this is Jeff Klein. I don't have a dog in this hunt working for the ABA, but frequently the NAIC includes drafting notes. So given the good comments Representative Allison made and Brad made about the necessity for this legislation, but to bridge the gap with the view of others. Could a drafting note be affixed to the model of giving states the discretion to assign this to a committee other than insurance if necessary? Just a suggestion. And a great suggestion. I think that uh, certainly worthy of consideration as well. And again, that's the beauty of INCOIL is that this is, this is at the end of the day, guidance for state legislatures uh, in the first place. So um, appreciate those comments, Jeffrey, thanks. Anyone else with or without a dog in the fight? Any dogs wanting to fight? All right, I've given consideration. Uh, let me find my way back to my, to my agenda. Uh, again, I really do appreciate everyone's engagement on this issue. Uh, I think anyone who's been in a legislature for very long at all has, 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 uh, had to address this issue. I remember, and I hope my wife can't hear this, before she and I met, I, I went on a date with a girl and she was hesitant to meet me where we met and we had a nice little date and then she walked out to find that her Jeep had uh, its catalytic converter stolen. And that was that was our last, our last date. So it all worked out, but I have my personal issues with catalytic converter theft. Mr. Chairman, will there be issues before this committee that don't tie into your personal life in some way, or is that one of the filters you're gonna apply? I think it's a part of my charm, and uh, I will not be entertaining any uh, any arguments otherwise. So, with that, thank you, Tom. With that, um, I want to give one last chance for anybody, uh, in addition to the the authors of this this effort, to make any closing remarks, uh, Representative Oliverson or, or uh, Representative Jordan. Okay. okay, well, I appreciate, uh, your, uh, I appreciate your presiding over this meeting, Mr. Chairman. I can see I chose wisely in, in nominating you to that position, and I look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you, sir. I hope what I what I lack in my ability to turn my camera on, I make up for my ability to, to lead a speedy and fun meeting. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if there is no other business uh, that anyone would like to raise... I would just like to remind everyone that registration for the spring meeting is uh, now open. It'll be in Nashville, and please be sure to register and book your hotel as soon as possible, or Pat Gilbert will be contacting you to ask you why you have not. I'm going to give one last, uh, one last chance for anybody who might have a comment. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. We adjourn. So moved. Do I hear a second? 
I think I saw Matt Lehman second it. All in favor? Uh, aye. All opposed? Great. Well, um, the technical issues notwithstanding, I think this was a good, good first meeting for me, and I really do look forward to engaging with everyone on these issues and the other ones that we see uh, coming up in Nashville. But until then, I will see you all later. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend.